Hey all you bodhisattvas out there, welcome back to the Fearless Wisdom channel. In the last video of this series on the history of Buddhist philosophy in India, we went over the history of Buddhism from the Buddha all the way up to the two main schools of Mahayana Buddhism, Yogacara and Madhyamaka. In this video, we are going to go over the school of Dignaga and Dharmakirti, uh, the, also called the epistemological school, Pramanavada. So stay tuned and don't be afraid to think. Now this school, which I will call Pramanavada, and this is a modern term used by modern scholars, though it's based on a Tibetan term, this tradition focused on epistemology, on pramanas, which means epistemic warrant, epistemic tools, or, or means of knowledge. This school was trying to develop a robust epistemological system that Buddhists could use to defend their arguments and critique their opponents. This tradition grew to be perhaps the most influential Buddhist philosophical school in India. And this is because they influenced both of the main Mahayana schools that we discussed in the last video, as well as many Hindu and also Jain philosophers who responded to the thinkers of this tradition. The first one of these thinkers was Dignaga. Dignaga was a student of Vasubandhu who had also written a work on reasoning and he is also influenced by the Hindu Nyaya school uh, which had written various works and commentaries on epistemology as well. Dignaga wrote a text called the Compendium of Pramana, the Pramana Samuchaya, as well as some other, some other texts which, which have survived, mainly in Tibetan translation. Dignaga's work led to what has been called by some scholars an epistemological turn in Indian philosophy. That is to say that after Dignaga, Indian philosophy became much more concerned with epistemological questions and with developing an epistemological system that could be used to ground the claims, the religious claims that, that these various Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain philosophies of religion were, were making. So, now of course, Dignaga, like I said earlier, Dignaga wasn't the first epistemological author in ancient India, but he was perhaps one of the most influential ones and he lived during a time when this turn was taking place. Um, so, you know, he didn't initiate this turn per se, perhaps, but he definitely was riding the, 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 the peak of that wave there. So here uh, you can see an image of uh, Dignaga. And he's depicted in a debating stance. This is a Tibetan illustration. And he's about to sort of slap his hand and this is how, in Tibetan Buddhism, when they do formal debates, when they're going to make a point or they're going to make some kind of assertion, they will, they will do this, they will slap their hands after they've, they've made their point. And this sort of helps to illustrate what was happening in India at the time of these philosophers. Um, there was much more interreligious debate going on, uh, public debates, and these... Different, different religious philosophers were beginning to develop a much more technical philosophical system and developing a much more cogent and robust theory of epistemology became a very important part of defending your tradition, of also trying to even explain to yourself, like, why is it that we believe what we believe? Do we have good reasons to believe these religious doctrines that have been passed down in our tradition? Because if we don't, then perhaps we need to change our minds. So, you know, this, not just to, like, defeat others, but it was part of the pursuit of truth that, you know, the Buddha and all great religious traditions agree upon, that, that we're all trying to find the truth. Now, the epistemology of this Buddhist school is based on two 
pramanas or two main pramanas. And I have a quote here from Dignaga where he explains this basic foundational theory of this school. He says, sensation and reasoning are the only two means of acquiring knowledge, pramana, because these two attributes are knowable. There is no knowable object other than the peculiar and the general attribute. Sensation has the peculiar attribute as its subject matter, while reasoning has the general attribute as its subject matter. So, in this tradition, there are two main pramanas, two main means of acquiring knowledge. Perception, or sensation, and inference, or reasoning. Let's go over these one by one. First, we have pratyaksha, which can be sensations or perceptions. It's important to understand that what the Buddhist philosopher here means by pratyaksha is not what we mean by everyday perceptions. Rather, these are understood in this system as non-conceptual perceptions of ultimately real particulars or individual percepts. Uh, the object of the, the pratyaksha is this phalakshana, these minute and very momentary, very small uh, particulars, which aggregate together into larger uh, objects, which are the second pramana. So this isn't like, when I see a tree and I see a, a the, and I have the image of a tree in my mind, that's actually not a perception here. So perhaps perception isn't the best translation for pratyaksha. What we're talking about here is immediate sense impressions, which are quite momentary, quite short, and quite simple. These sense impressions are pre-linguistic, they're completely raw and unstructured sense data. So, I guess I have some examples here, the percept of green, which would be momentary, or like a momentary flash of green, uh, the sensation of roughness. These, these base sensations are also explained by the Buddhist philosophers as never being faulty. And this is because they're just raw sensations, right? Like prior to any interpretation or any aggregation uh, of, of the cognitive faculty, this is kind of the, the, the raw bits that our cognition uses to build up the world. So they can never be like wrong. It, Wrong occurs on a higher level for the Buddhist. These uh, sensations are the foundation of all knowledge and all cognition. They're like the atoms of perception and cognition and, and thinking. All of these particular perceptions, they're also ineffable. And they are not a subject of words. So what we're seeing here already is a kind of epistemic foundationalism. Which sees these particulars, these svalakshanas, as grounding all knowledge and all everyday perceptions, including all of our perceptions of, of macroscopic objects. So, like I said, in, in this system, macro objects that we perceive in our minds, these images, they're not actually, uh, uh, I have here pradyakshas, but what I sh should have said is svalakshanas. So, like, when I see the image of a tree, I'm not seeing the svalakshana of a tree. I'm seeing a bunch of tiny action as momentary that have been aggregated by my mind. Now, the second pramana, the second means of knowledge or instrument of knowledge, is inference, anumana. This is a general conceptual construction which is based on the minute and particular perceptions. This is a cognitive function and it generates general characteristics, samanya lakshanas. So this can include things like hot. We know that there are many fires that are hot, but we have this idea of, of hotness uh, or the idea of blueness. This is, this is a general characteristic that we apply to many different uh, things that we see, many mental images that we have. Now, this inference uh, we, might, we have to understand that, that even though the term that is used to translate anumana is inference, this isn't just inferential reasoning properly conceived, like building up a logical argument or anything like that. It, it also includes cognitive processes, including perceptual judgments that we are making every day. Like, I'm, here's a book, here's a, a cup. Um, so, 
there's this cognitive element to anumana that is not just inferential or rational thinking about uh, making arguments and so forth. It, 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 is, it is a cognitive activity which synthesizes and arranges all the various particulars, all the various percepts, into more general or universal concepts. And this side of inference, which is the more uh, basic side of inference, is what is called by the Buddhist epistemologists inference for oneself. Of course, there is also a more rationalistic kind of anumana, which is called inference for others. And this is when we use language to express various synthetic arrangements of truths that we, we've perceived through the means of some kind of formal syllogism or rational argument. And this is called inference for others. Now, an important thing to understand about inference is that it is understood by these Buddhist thinkers as always being distorted in some ways. And this is because inference is already one step removed from direct contact with ultimate reality, with the particulars. It is always superimposing, it is always conceptualizing these universals, which are not ultimately real, it is superimposing this, these universal categories into ultimate reality, which is just a sheer flux of constantly changing particulars. So it is never going to map, this, this map is never going to map into ultimate reality perfectly. The map is not the territory, right? So this is why Buddhist thinkers always see inference as being removed from the real uh, ultimate reality, the, the, the true ultimate reality. It is always in that way distorted in some sense. It's always distorting reality in some sense, even if it can be useful. Uh, you know, language and, and, and perceptual judgments are, are useful for moving, getting around in the world, but it, it is always distorting the way things really are um, in some way. Another related thing here that we need to understand is that the object of inference and the object of the perceptions are two different cognitive objects. And what I mean here is for the Buddhist epistemologist, when I see a fire, it's actually a different object. It's a different mental image. Uh, uh, or it's a, it's a different thing than the mental image somebody else cognizes when they use inference to know that there is a fire where I am. When I, when I see a fire, what I'm seeing directly is these bare particulars flashing constantly, and I, and I have a, a, a perception of that. When someone uses inference to know that there is a fire, perhaps they see smoke, and then they infer there's a fire there, they are grasping a mental image, a universal constructed by their mind. But they don't see the flux which gives rise to my mental image of fire. So, this object of inference and the object of perception are not the same thing. Now, it's possible for me to have both at the same time, because when I'm looking at a fire, I'm experiencing both the object of perception, the, the, the particulars, and I also have in my mind the, uh, the object of inference, because I'm inferring that there's a fire, but they're not the same exact thing. And that's, that's kind of important uh, for the Buddhist understanding of how these two pramanas are, are different. Now, these pramanavada philosophers, uh, beginning with Dignaga, are 
nominalists. They're nominalist philosophers. So they reject universals or natural kinds. And because of this, then they need to explain how inference maps linguistic terms to reality. If there is nothing like a universal, like, like a universal of blue, uh, which exists independently of the particulars, how is it possible for language to capture um, the, the fact of blueness? Well, Dignaga develops a theory to help explain this, and this is the famous theory of Apoha, exclusion. It's an it's anomalous theory which argues that any word or concept points to its object merely by excluding everything else that is not of a, of a like kind. So, Dignaga says, a word talks about entities only as they are qualified by the negation of other things. So what does this mean? This means the word cow, for example, excludes all things that are not cows. As such, there are no real universals. They exist as mental constructs. So this is kind of like a quasi-universal, in a sense, that, that is constructed by the mind. But it doesn't exist apart from that activity, that, that, that mental process. So in this sense, there's no actual essence, which is shared by all cows or all green things or whatever, that makes them what they are. What, there's no essence shared by cows that make them a cow. There's only that inferential constructive activity, which is based on exclusion. It's based on negation. Okay, now we get to the fun part, the canonical syllogism. So like all philosophers, uh, the, the Buddhist epistemologist develops a, a way of constructing a syllogistic argument. And this, this is not like the Western classical logic syllogism. So even though we're using the term syllogism, let's not get confused here. This is its own kind of thing. And we're just going to look at it. First, the first part of it is the thesis, paksha. So here, the thesis consists of two parts. The first is the subject of inference. So here, it's sound. So that's the subject. And it also includes the second part, which is the inferable property. Here, it is non-eternality. So we have sound is non-eternal. The second part of this syllogism is the reason, hetu. So why sound not eternal? It is because it is immediately connected with an effort. And that, that is called the inferential sign, being connected with an effort. That's a basic argument here, but the canonical syllogisms often have uh, extra parts, and these are examples, and they sort of help to uh, prove and provide further reasons for believing the uh, the hetu, the reason part. So these are the examples, the drishtantas. There's there's an example which is similar to the thesis. So here it says that which is immediately connected with an effort is observed to be non-eternal, like a pot. So here we say that a pot is similar to sound. But you can also have a dissimilar example. And here we have that which is eternal is observed to not be immediately connected with effort, like space. Now certain Buddhist schools held that space was an eternal existent phenomenon. So that is the reason why that is there, because they did not consider space to be of the same kind of existence as sound. And another way of putting this, this simple syllogism is uh, A is like B because of being C, like D. And there could be different examples in D including dissimilar and similar examples. Now, notice the structure here of what the Buddhist epistemologists are saying. They're saying, to be able to gain knowledge that 
some inferable property, which is sadhya in Sanskrit, and this is this is uh, exemplified here by non-eternality. Uh, B here, which I've labeled as B. Uh, uh, any inferable, an, an inferable property, is inherent in a subject of inference, paksha here, and I've labeled that as A. To be able to gain knowledge of that, that B is inherent in A, there must be something with that they call an inferential sign, linga. Uh, so that's the reason, right? Uh, so you have to have a reason for believing that, you know, something is the case. Now there's a further element to this syllogism, and that is that all of this has to be supported by what the uh, Sanskrit Buddhist philosophers called good reasons, sadhetu. And this is explained which, with what is called the triple mark criterion, Traipuriya. The first of these marks is that the inferential sign here is uh, being immediately connected with an effort in the argument here. The inferential sign must be a property of the subject, right? So if sound is... If you can prove that sound is not connected with making an effort, if, if sound just happens without someone having to make a sound, uh, or without anything, any, any causes uh, coming together for it, um, then this argument's not going to work. And the context of this argument, actually, just, just to go back a little bit, because, like, why would everyone make this argument about sound being non-eternal? Like, what's the point of that? It, the context here is that Brahminical philosophers, certain Brahminical philosophers, were arguing that the Vedas were uncreated. And so the Buddhists, and, and, and they were saying that actually sound was eternal, and the sound of the Vedas was uncreated and eternal. And this was all part of the Brahminical philosophical uh, project to defend the authority of the Vedas. And, and mantras also, the authority of Vedic mantras. So the Buddhist here is arguing that sound is not eternal to undercut that uh, theory of the Brahminical philosophers. Anyways, um, back to the triple mark criterion. So, so the first mark is that the inferential sign must be a property of the subject. So, you know, you have to sound is connected with an effort, according to the Buddhists, and he will argue that. So, then, then the next mark of this uh, good reason criterion is that the inferential sign must also be a property of some other subject that is similar to A, and also has the inferable property B. So, in this case, uh, the example, uh, what we're talking about here, the, the other subject is the pot, right, in example D. So a pot is also connected with an effort because you need to make you need to make the pot and there was an effort that went into making the pot. And it also has the inferable property B, so it is not eternal. So that example is is then then you can prove that okay, this example is similar to the thesis. And then the third part of this uh, triple mark criterion is uh, that the inferential sign must also not occur in any other subject which lacks B. Uh, I should have probably put here any other similar subject which lacks B. So, if you can find something that is connected with effort but is not, but is eternal, if you can prove that, then the argument, then you can undercut this argument as well. But if all of these three marks uh, obtain, then we have what the Buddhist cosmologists call pervasion, which uh, means that we can generalize a property from C, from that reason, and apply to all, uh, all A's, to all sounds in this case. And this is a uh, very common way that the Buddhist epistemologists uh, built up their philosophical arguments, this uh, canonical syllogism. Now, there is still a lot of discussion among modern uh, scholars who study this, this work of Dignaga and Dharmakirti about, uh, there, there's debate among them about what, what kind of reasoning this should be categorized as. And, and what I mean by this is, of course, 
you know, we have the whole modern Western analytical philosophy uh, uh, system of thought and, and Western classical logic. So, in here we have, in, 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 the, in the Western systems of logic, we have inductive reasoning, abductive reasoning, uh, uh, deductive reasoning, and so on. So, you know, Western scholars are sort of like trying to, trying to understand this system and trying to say, is it, a, is it inductive reasoning? Can it be deductive reasoning? Um, you know, so, so some scholars do think that that this logic is a kind of inductive reasoning, which is which is when which is where uh, general inferences based on various particular observations uh, are made. So you you observe many things, uh, you know, all swans are white or whatever, right? And then like you 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 because you've observed a bunch of swans being white, you know, and, and that could be wrong though. Like that's not a that's not a, a, a absolutely an absolute uh, kind of kind of reasoning. But, but other modern scholars also think that Dignagas reasoning was meant to be deductive. Um, and that's when a conclusion must follow logically from all of the premises. So um, I don't think that Indian philosophers made, made those kinds of uh, uh, categorical uh, divisions when it came to epistemology and their use of arguments because these are really Western constructs. These different these ways of, of dividing up reasoning, um, but you know I mean whatever the case, um, it's clear that the kind of reasoning that that these Buddhist epistemologists were using includes both formal and epistemic dimensions that are mixed together. So it's not like a pure form of logic, like classical logic. Um, it, it it includes many epistemological and, and other rational. Uh, uh, ideas mix, mixed in. Um, so it's not just meant to, to be a pure sort of formal logic. It, it has to have pragmatic uh, uh, elements here that can help you gain knowledge in the real world. And um, another thing here is that Dignaga considered these inferences to be fallible and feasible. So it doesn't seem like it could be deductive in the, in the classic sense. If it could, some arguments might have been constructed. So as if you look at them, they're deductive, but it's uh, I don't. It doesn't seem like they were they were meant to be that way, always. But anyways, um, this this so-called canonical syllogism uh, that was uh, that we see in Dignaga was was adopted by almost every Indian uh, philosopher after Dignaga, uh, including people like uh, you know. Gina Badra, who was a Jain thinker, and Kumari Labata, a very influential uh, Indian thinker, and other Buddhist and, and Hindu philosophers. And and just a quick note here, you know, Indian Buddhist philosophers also used various other forms of arguments, including reductios like prasanga, which we saw with the Madhyamaka school, um, uh, suppositional reasoning, uh, tarka, and also something which is similar to what we call today a disjunctive syllogism. Which they called in Sanskrit the Arthapati, and 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 Indian philosophers also recognized bad reasons like infinite regresses and circular reasoning. And indeed, Dignaga in his Pramana Samuchaya lists fourteen types of common fallacies. So you know these these Indian uh, philosophers they had a basic understanding of of uh, uh, reasoning and what was what were good reasons and dialectic and so forth. So. Um, just, just wanted to make that quick, uh, quick note about that. There, that, that they were they were sophisticated thinkers as well, just like you know Western philosophers at this time. So Dignaga also developed a complex theory of perception. In his system, there are four main uh, types of perception that that he discussed. The first is perception by the five sense faculties. Then in the second. It, it's you could divide it into two parts, but it's mental perception, uh, so it's awareness, an internal uh, kind of perception. Uh, this includes mental perception, which deals with external objects. So, it, in your mind, you see a color, but that is uh, something which is ex being externally perceived. And you also have mental perception of internal feelings, like desire and so forth. Then there's another kind of perception, which is yogic perception, which is a kind of intuitive, a pure and intuitive perception, which is not mixed with any concepts. 
and it, it is seeing the true nature of things. And then the other kind of, of perception, which is discussed by Dignaga, is self-awareness, Svasam Vedana. And this is a kind of awareness of awareness, when, when a state of cognition is reflexively aware of itself. So Dignaga defended this theory, which we saw previously defended by other uh, schools of Buddhism, mainly the Mahasangika school. He defended this theory of Svasam Vedana, or self-reflective awareness. A lot of Abhidharma schools had also held that when there's any moment, at any moment of cognition, that moment does not know itself. But it is known by a subsequent moment that knows that past cognition. But there was other, another theory, which is the theory of Svasa Vedana. That theory held that all moments of consciousness are reflexively aware of themselves. So... And Dignaga defends this view, and so for him, any and all moments of consciousness, they're not only aware of its intentional object, but they're also simultaneously aware of the conscious experience itself. And they're aware of itself. So, and this is, comp this is compared to a lamp that illuminates a room and also illuminates itself. So, another way of saying this is, cognition is aware of itself by means of itself. And this is the, the theory of Svasam Vedana, which would become... Uh, influential, it still is in, in Tibetan Buddhism and for, for later forms of Buddhism. Now, previous Buddhist philosophers and thinkers had argued that this, this, uh, this idea was impossible. And they used the example of like a blade can't cut itself. And, and other, uh, other, they used other examples to show that you know, a thing cannot operate on itself. A finger can't point at itself and so on. So Dignaga is going to argue that uh, this does not apply to the case of self-reflective consciousness. And he's going to say that, that the reason it doesn't apply, that these examples don't apply, because uh, self-consciousness is not an activity which is in a subject-object mode. Uh, like a blade which operates on something, you have the subject that operates on an object, but it can't do it on itself. He's going to say consciousness is not like that. And, and therefore the example does not work. He's going to say, he's going to use the light example, the lamp example, and say that consciousness is more like that. Um, and, and ultimately he's going to say that cognition and that, and that self-reflective, the self-reflectivity of cognition are not two separate things. They're, 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 this, they're actually one thing. And because it's, uh, something which transcends that subject-object mode, it's, it's not going to be a problem for consciousness to do that uh, to itself. Um, now, apart from a reflexive awareness, there is also the subject-object oriented mode of cognition. That is also a mode of cognition. Not all modes of cognition are, are uh, in the same mode. And, and, and this mode of cognition is when there is one cognitive aspect which is the grasper, grahaka, uh, which is apprehending another aspect, the grasped, grahya. And this is the intentional mode of consciousness. So, Dignaga is not going to reject that there is this subject-object mode of consciousness. He's just going to say that the reflexive mode, the reflexive awareness is something else. It's the reflexive mode of consciousness. And uh, he also argued that if we do not posit this self-reflexivity, then we're going to need some kind of second-order mental, mental state to explain how self-awareness is possible, how we know that we are aware right now. I know that I uh, am I'm holding this, this bottle of water. How do I know that? Either the very moment of consciousness that knows it is aware of itself, or there's some second order consciousness, either on top of it or in time and subsequent to it in time, which is aware of it. So you have this two two lit levels of, of consciousness here. That's the way that it was explained by other Abhidharma schools. But according to Dignaga. You have a problem here if you have this theory. 
because then this is going to lead to an infinite regress because the second order mental state um, can o can only be conscious if you if then the only way for the second uh, order mental state to be conscious is by appealing to another <laughs> uh, uh, third order at the, in this time mental state because that's that's how you explain self aware uh, self awareness in the first place. You you explained it you explained it uh, by appealing to a, a something on top, and now. Uh, you have to explain it again according to the Naga, so it's it's just, just going to be some kind of uh, uh, infinite regress that you'll never be able to get to the end. So the Naga just says, no, it's there's no point in doing this uh, different orders of reflexivity. You just say that any moment of consciousness is aware of itself and that its own power like a lamp and, and you don't need any further uh, uh, explanations for that. Now the next great Buddhist epistemological thinker is Dharmakirti. He lived at some point between the 6th to 7th centuries. His uh, main work is the Pramana Vartika, which is a commentary on Dignaga's Pramana Samuchaya. He lived in Nalanda, and according to some hagiographical accounts, he debated and defeated the Hindu philosophers Kumar Labata and Adi Shankara. Now, it's it's hard to know what to make of this. I mean, you know, Hindu hagiographical hagi accounts also say they d debated and defeated Buddhist philosophers. So, like both sides say that that you know each each one of their guys def beat the other guys. But I think the important thing to get out of these stories is that there was a lot of interreligious debate going on, a public interreligious debate, and uh, all religious traditions in India at the time saw. Uh, the the job of the philosopher, the religious philosopher, as defending their system against the critiques of others, and uh, doing so in public, and this was seen as something that was very important. So, uh, whether or not you know who won or not, I mean, <laughs> uh, I think the the historical evidence shows that uh, there was just a lot of this, these debates going on. Just like today, there's all these debates between different you know religious people on online and so forth uh, back then it was the same it was it was you know except it was more in a public square uh, than than um, in person than on the internet so Dharmakirti is is being a follower of Dignaga he's going to defend uh, Dignaga's view of Pramana and the same reductionist view that only momentarily existing particulars are real and everything is conventionally, and everything else is just conventionally or conceptually existent. Um, but he's going to modify uh, the Gnaga system in several key ways, and, and one of those is that he's going to bring in a lot of talk about causal powers and 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 uh, causal efficacy. Uh, that is to say, in his system, that comes more to the fore. Uh, what it means for something to be real and what it means for something to have to be a pramana and to have uh, epistemic value is also that is somehow connected to uh, uh, causal processes. And I have a quote here from the Pramana Vartika where Damarkirti says, Whatever has causal powers, Artha Kriya Samartha, that really exists, Paramartha Sat. In this metaphysical context, Anything else is declared to be just customarily existent, samvratisat. These two are particulars and universals. So he's using the same system as Dignaga. There are particulars and there are universals. Um, but the, the particulars are what have causal powers. And this is in a way unique to Dhammakirti. This is the unique move that Dhammakirti makes in the Buddhist epistemological system. So what this means for Dharmakirti is that all general characteristics, all things that we know through inference, uh, the general characteristics being the Samanya Lakshanas, these are all nominal fictions without any causal efficacy. And they're only, therefore they're only conventionally real. They're only part of the conventional truth. And this is because the only thing that ultimately exists is whatever has causal powers. As he has defined the, these two pramanas, uh, the ultimately existing thing is whatever has causal powers. And for, for the Buddhist epistemologists, universals lack any causal powers. 
they're just conceptual uh, superimpositions of our minds into the world. So this means that uh, qualities like blueness, hardness, chairness, or any individual's personality-ness, what makes that person who they are um, over time, uh, all of this is a mental construct, and it's uh, ultimately unreal. So, you know, m whatever makes me what I am over time, uh, uh, fearless wisdom-ness, <laughs> whatever, uh, all of that is uh, is ultimately unreal. And um, and this also means all macroscopic objects are unreal. You know, chairs and, and, and computers and so on. Um, only the momentary particulars are exist. So again, this is a kind of Abhidharma reductionism, just modified in different ways. And uh, this also means that no thing remains the same for more than one instant, because everything is constantly changing very rapidly in this uh, uh, Buddhist Abhidharma way of understanding the world. And it also means that all of our everyday perceptions are theory-laden with superimpositions, because everything that we see is basically macro-objects. Uh, uh, and all of these are actually unreal in the sense, but our, the way we experience the world is laden with these superimpositions that we uh, uh, impose on the world. Kind of like how when we look at a computer, everything that we see uh, is just uh, something which is useful for us to navigate around on the computer, but that's not really what's happening under the hood. Uh, what's happening under the hood is, is all these technical uh, things, all these ones and zeros, all this code, that's what's really real in that sense, um, according to, to this understanding of things. And I have a quote here by Tom Tillemans, which uh, sort of explains this a bit more. He says, It is only a series of qualitatively similar moments that constitute what we customarily take to be enduring objects. But there's actually nothing that remains numerically the same for more than one instant. And uh, the the partless particulars are also understood by Dharmakirti to be causal powers which give rise to, cogn to cognitions. So Dharmakirti would not understand the particulars and the causal powers as two distinct things. Like there's the particulars and then the particulars have causal powers. They're not two separate things. They're the same thing. So they just are that causal power. They are what they do in this sense. So because of Dharmakirti's uh, theory of causal powers as being the most important part of uh, what makes something real, he, he rejects uh, the theory of universals. Because no causal effect can be observed that could point to the existence of a universal. He says, look, these universals, they don't have any actual causal powers that we can see. Like, just because I see green... My, my perception of green, in my mind, could have some sort of cause, causal power in the sense that it, it, it calms me down or something. But greenness itself doesn't have causal powers, at least according to someone like Dharmakirti. And he also thinks that universals have myriological problems because they would have to be both unitary and multiple at the same time. So there would have to be something which is green, and it's always the same greenness, but at the same time also exists in all green things. And he thinks that this is contradictory, that you can't have something which is unitary and multiple at the same time. So, therefore, you know, he's going to reject uh, the theory of universals. Instead, he's going to posit that there's these general characteristics or kind of quasi-universals that are constructed by the mind, which are linguistic and conceptual superimpositions, which, which is imposed by the mind on the causal flux of all of the particulars, of the momentary particulars that are the real phenomena which actually exist. These general characteristics, these mental, con these mental constructs, are based on previous experiences of other particulars, and they also conceal the true nature of the causal flux. Because the causal flux is not conceptual, it's not linguistic, it's not general, but it's particular and it's momentary. Oh, but also, these mental constructs, they also rely on the causal efficacy 
of the particulars to, so that they can develop as concepts. It is because of the causal efficacy of the particulars that the mind is able to construct the various uh, general characteristics. And according to some modern scholars like Tom Tillemans, this is understood as a kind of trope nominalism, which is a respectable modern nominalist theory. And here tropes are particular qualities like shape, weight, etc. that various objects can have which are distinct from each other. So they're particular qualities. They're not like universals uh, metaphysically. But they're, they're particular qualities which are distinct but they also exactly resemble each other. So there's like a greenness trope and in each green thing there's, there's a greenness trope. And this is the trope, trope nominalist theory. And, and according to some scholars, the Dharma Kirti view is very similar to this, if not identical. So, for the Dharma Kirti, the fact that any phenomenon, any Dharma, any particular, can be, that can, which can be said to exist, is exercising causal powers. This, for Dharma Kirti, proves that they are constantly changing moment to moment. And this is the famous theory of momentariness. And, and it comes in many forms, but in the form which is defended by Dharmakirti and the Pramanavada scholars, it's a very radical kind of theory uh, where things are changing very rapidly. And they're, they're ceasing to exist as soon as they arise. Uh, as soon as something arises, that Dharma exercises its causal power and immediately ceases to exist. Now, according to Dharmakirti, since nothing can cause new effects without changing in some way, anything that is truly permanent is unable to produce effects. It, it, it can't produce various effects because it's this unchanging thing. And to produce effects is to change in some way. It's to do something. And... If something is eternal, then it can't produce a series of different effects. It can only just exist eternally. Either doing one thing or just, just existing by, by the mere... Uh, uh, that, that's the only power that it has. And this theory was used by the Buddhists to refute different conceptions of an unchanging soul or, or self, the Atman. As well as, by, as well as to attack the idea of Hindu social caste, uh, which they held was based on universals. So by critiquing uh, the theory of universals, Dharmakirti is actually also uh, attacking the Hindu caste system, which was philosophically defended by using the theory of universals. And of course, also they're going to attack the Hindu theory of an uh, unchanging creator god, Ishvara, so later, later thinkers like uh, Moksha Karagupta, who was actually a very interesting uh, thinker of the Pramanavada school because he was an externalist. He held that there was an external world, whereas most Pramanavada thinkers are going to be Yogacharans. They're going to ultimately be idealists. But uh, late, the later Moksha Karagupta, that later thinker, he argued that the cognitions that we have of a so-called self, they only arise intermittently. And therefore, whatever causes these these cognitions that we have, that there is a self, cannot be an eternal self. And similarly, uh, later, later scholars of the uh, epistemological school, like a uh, thinker called Ratnakirti, are going to argue that an unchanging God cannot create the world. Because the world is a changing and variegated thing, and an unchanging God would be a singular eternal cause, and, and this singular eternal cause, because eternal things cannot create many effects, um, then there cannot be uh, an unchanging God. Because then it would have to itself be changing to create these variegated effects. Per perhaps this argument might be stronger against like a classical theist view, where God is this like perfectly unchanging, singular, simple thing. Um, but... It's, it's, uh, it, it's an argument that, that the Buddhists made against the concept of God that, that certain Hindu thinkers had. So Dharmakirti 
accepts Dignaga's epistemological theory, that there are two pramanas, but he's going to modify it in a certain way using his causal theory. He's going to say that the meaning of pramana, the real meaning of pramana is a reliable cognition which confirms causal efficacy, artha kriya stiti. And therefore, it is a reliable basis on which to act and ground our expectations about how things act in the world. And I have a quote here from uh, Pramanavartika, where Dhammakirti says, A pramana is a reliable cognition. As for reliability, it consists in this cognition's compliance with the object's capacity to perform a function. And modern scholars see this in different ways. Some understand that as a kind of pragmatism. Uh, Jose Cabezon and, and, and some others also, uh, they follow this, this view. And others see it as a kind of weak correspondence theory. And, and, and the issue at hand here is how you understand what it means to confirm causal efficacy and to be a reliable basis on which to act. If you understand this more as a kind of everyday, how is it useful for you? And it, does it help you get what you want? So is it going to help you achieve enlightenment, for example, at least from the Buddhist point of view? Or is it going to help you uh, be more compassionate? Then in this sense, it's, it's more of a kind of pragmatic theory. But if you understand it as being more about uh, the confirming of causal efficacy, then it's going to perhaps be more of a correspondence theory. Or perhaps it combines both. Perhaps it's a theory that has both elements. Um, and, and, it, and it can't be just compared to one Western epistemic theory. Now, Damakirti is also going to support and defend the theory of Apoha that was uh, developed by Dignaga. Hindu philosophers like Kumarila and Udyok Takara, they had argued against Dignaga that Apoha theory was circular, which, or at least that it was incomplete. Because to know what is being negated, to do some kind of negation, like the Apoha theory uh, requires, for that to work at all, you need to know what it is that you're negating or on what basis you're negating. So if you're saying that uh, a cow is defined as that which is not cow, well, okay, but like, what, how do you know what is not cow? <laughs> so, um, you know, how do you establish cow via negation as, as something that's not non-cow? Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, perhaps Dignaga had an answer to this, but um, he doesn't specifically say it in his work. So, Dharamakirti modified the Apoha theory. And again, he brought in causality and causal powers to explain how this works. So, I have here a quote from Tom Telemans, which sort of explains the basics of what Dharmakirti had in mind here. Tom says, The way words link to things is thus primarily explained through the existence of a causal chain, from particular things to perceptions to thoughts and to the utterances of words. In short, we have a type of causal theory of reference. Thoughts and thoughts and talk of blue are thus about blue things because only blue things play the appropriate causal role in leading to the thought, and finally, the word. And the example that we can give here uh, is that there are many different types of medicinal herbs that can lower a fever, but they all have the same effect, lowering the fever. So we can classify them, and we do, as antipyretic medicines. Um, and, and, I mean, this is just a basic explanation. This theory actually gets quite complicated. Uh, as, as all modern causal theories of reference and analytic philosophy get complicated. So check the Stanford Encyclopedia article on Dharmakirti for more details on this. It's, it's, it's quite interesting and complicated. Now, when it comes to perception, the Pramanavadans have a similar problem. Only particulars exist. But any cognitive image that we have, any collective... Con it's going to be, any, any macroscopic image, it's going to be based on collections and aggregates of all these tiny momentary particulars, which are invisible on, on their own. So how, how does this happen? Dharma Kirti and his commentators, they're going to say that the aggregates work together to produce 
a causal effect, a causal function that gives rise to a cognitive image. So even though we can't see these particulars on their own, when they come together, they have enough of a causal power to give rise to a cognitive image. However, Dharmakirti's metaphysics is ultimately going to drop this view, which is more based on a Sautrantica external view that there are these kind of atoms and, and, and things in the external world. He's going to drop this view in favor of the Yogacara consciousness only view, in which uh, matter is unreal and the external world is unreal, and uh, ultimate reality transcends subject object distinctions of, of an observer who is looking at an external world. He's not going to. He's not going to completely abandon the view that there's an external world, but he's going to leave it at a certain level of analysis, which is ultimately going to be transcended by the yoga chara view. So there's again a kind of two level uh, metaphysics going on here, or at least epistemology. And Dharmakirti is going to give various arguments for idealism, like the yoga chara thinkers did. One of these is called the invariable co-apprehension argument, <laughs> Sahopalambaniyama. And John Taber restates or explains the, the main idea of this argument as follows. Cognition and object are not different because they are invariably perceived together. The major premise of the argument, as one might reconstruct it, is that two things that are invariably or perhaps necessarily found together are not different. Consider the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Armed Forces and the President of the United States. The minor premise of the argument is that one is not aware of an object without being aware of a cognition of an object, and vice versa. This premise expresses the principle that all cognition is self-aware. So, even though we can uh, conventionally explain perception using the realist model, at the level of ultimate truth, Dharmakirti is going to say, look, there's various arguments we can make, which show that idealism is ultimately a higher truth than this realist model, which we can use to explain how perception works and so on and so forth, but ultimately we have to sort of do away with that. Now this way of using a realist model and then an idealist model has been called a sliding scale of analysis by some modern interpreters. And what this means is that, yeah, on one analytical level, one uses a realist account, but you abandon this at a higher level. And this can be compared to sort of how we use Newtonian physics, but when we're using, uh, but when we get to a to certain phenomena that can't be explained by Newtonian physics, then we use uh, relativity. Dharmakirti, like Dignaga, also defended the theory of reflexive awareness which is the idea that consciousness is also conscious of itself, like a lamp that illuminates itself. He provided other arguments for this, for this uh, view, which became a pretty standard Yogacara view after this time. Dharmakirti is also going to use a uh, myriological argument, an argument about parts and wholes, to critique the ultimate reality of causal relations. So he's not just going to critique the reality of subject and the object, and the uh, existence of the eternal world, he actually is also going to critique the ultimate uh, reality of causal relations. Which is something that uh, thinkers like, like Madhyamaka thinkers had done before Dharmakirti. But it is surprising to find uh, someone who considers himself a kind of rationalist thinker, a Yogacharan, to uh, critique uh, the reality of the ultimate reality of causal relations, especially since it's so important in his system, as we have seen. But yeah, Dharmakirti is going to say, uh, you know, is a relation between two objects identical with or distinct from them, and using that dilemma, Dharmakirti is going to say, look, both options lead to problems, so the causality does not exist in the ultimate truth. So like Yogacara or like Madhyamaka, he's going to say, yes, we can, we, causality is very important and we use causality to explain the everyday world, uh, just like a realist would. But ultimately, when the Buddhas or the Yogis perceive the ultimate truth, 
there's no uh, they don't they they will not perceive causality, and and when when we even when we use reason to uh, try to explain the the ultimate nature of things, at some point our explanation of causality starts to break down. Because of this critique that he made, uh, some later interpreters, some later epistemologists, also uh, they, they 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 interpreted him as a kind of Madhyamaka. So thinkers like Jitari and Moksha Karagupta, they 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 would say they would read Dharmakirti as doing something similar to what the Madhyamaka school was doing when they were criticizing the ultimate reality of causality. Um, these these thinkers thought that it was possible to apply the the the, the method, the certain arguments that Dharmakirti used, uh, myriological arguments, uh, to the mind itself. And to show that there was really no ultimate ground or philosophical position, including idealism. So these thinkers sort of saw what Dharmakirti was doing and he said, you can push it further and critique the Yogacara position, the Yogacara idealistic position as well, and and reach a more sort of anti-foundationalist Madhyamaka position using Dharmakirti's system. And they thought Dharmakirti had also been doing something like this. So Dharmakirti also even though he held mainly there's two pramanas, right, perception and inference, he also defended an idea that there were certain extraordinary pramanas. These extraordinary pramanas aren't really something that can be established in the same way that the first two pramanas were established. They're, they're kind of special, but um, he's going to defend them uh, in, in different ways nonetheless. And these extraordinary pramanas include uh, the scriptural, the Buddha scriptures, the words of the Buddha, uh, who, who Dharmakirti considered to be a epistemically authoritative person, a pramana purusha. And his basic argument is that the Buddha developed this extraordinary compassion uh, because he, he practiced the Buddhist path for, for eons, for many lifetimes. So because of that, he attained a certain kind of epistemic authority that none of us can have. And he's also going to defend the idea that yogic perception, yogi pradyaksha, is a an extraordinary kind of pramana. Now, neither Dharmakirti nor his commentator Shakyabudi are going to see scripture as a pramana per se, on its own. So now I'm going to walk back <laughs> what I just said, right? Like, Dharmakirti is going to say that scripture has, can be uh, or can act as a pramana in certain extraordinary circumstances and when dealing with certain radically inaccessible concerns, transcendent concerns. But in most cases, you're not going to use scripture to guide, to guide you on, on empirical matters that can be decided rationally. Uh, so when you can just use... Uh, perception and inference to gain knowledge of things so like through science or or, or through just observation or, or experiment or testing or just going out and looking at something you're not going to look at you're not really going to uh, uh, use scripture for that and and if you use the the two the whatever system of epistemology based on the two pramanas that you have and that shows you that something in scripture is wrong that's going to trump scripture so if you use perception and inference and you uh, you see something that's that's that goes against scripture. That's actually going to trump scripture, and th that's interesting actually. And it shows you. It, it reminds me of you know when they asked the Dalai Lama like, oh, what if science disproves like the Buddhist theory of rebirth? Like, wh what happens? And the Dalai Lama is like, well, Buddhism is going to have to change. <laughs> and that's because the Dalai Lama has read this this Buddhist philosopher. He's 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 system of, of thinking about philosophy is grounded on this kind of philosophical system. So for him, it just it makes perfect sense. Like, yeah, if I, if something proves it, that it's wrong, like if, through perception, through like logical inference, um, like we've proven through some experiments or whatever that like rebirth must be wrong, then yeah. Like, <laughs> it's just, you just have to abandon it. So, however, so Dharmakirti is going to say uh, all of this, but he's also going to say, but um, if scripture does not contradict perception or inference, and if we're dealing with things that are radically inaccessible, 
things that are kind of transcendent. So radically inaccessible, translating here at, at Yanta Paroksha. Um, and, and these are sort of questions that go beyond what we can uh, empirically understand. And, and, and what we mean here is things like soteriological questions, afterlife questions, these kinds of things. Then, then you can use scripture as a guide. You can use the scriptures of, uh, that, are, that were written down and passed down and used by uh, a specific tradition of, of, for you know, generations, and they've used it for developing virtue and so on. Um, and, and so we know that they, they're useful guides for this kind of thing. Now, such, such questions, like is there an afterlife and so forth, they go beyond reasoning in certain ways. And so, for Dhammakirti, only an extraordinary informant who has transcendent experiences, like a Buddha or, you know, perhaps some Buddhist yogis of the past or the students of the Buddha, whatever, who compiled the scriptures, uh, they're the ones who can guide us to those truths. Because those truths are beyond mere reasoning. They're beyond just... And, it, and they're beyond basic empirical observations. Uh, for Dhammakirti, they can only be accessed by someone who has had certain powerful spiritual experiences or religious experiences through intensive practice. However, even here, uh, Dharmakirti thinks that scripture is, is, is fallible and it's ultimately an uncertain source. It doesn't have like perfect certainty, like just perceiving that there's a fire in front of me. As such, even though scripture is important for, for these pragmatic reasons, since it helps us and it guides us when setting out on a spiritual path and a religious path and and we know it has helped others in the past, um, even though it's useful in this pragmatic way, um, the claims of Scripture regarding these radical and accessible facts, they're not, they're not, we know they're not, they're not grounded in objective facts, at least according to Dharma Kirti. That's what, that's, what, that's what he says. So we use Scripture in this pragmatic way, but we need to remember that it's not some objective thing. And it always has to be tempered with our reasoning and or just our perception. Um, and um, Dharmakirti is also going to say that there's this yogic perception, which can also be a, a sort of extraordinary problem. And for him, it's, this is basically a vivid, trustworthy perception of a concept arrived at through the power of meditation which has the effect of leading one to liberation. So actually, it's interesting. For, uh, for Dharma Kirti, yogic perception is not um, something which experiences the particulars, but it's something which experiences a concept. But it is a concept that can guide us and can lead our mind to liberation or to some step along the path to liberation. So... That, that is what Dharmakirti understands as yogic perception. So related to that is going to be the kind of meditation that's going to be advocated by Dharmakirti. Uh, and, and I think it's definitely closely related to the fact that he thinks that yogic perception is a perception of a concept. So he's going to advocate a form of meditation that is actually a kind of philosophizing, or it's grounded in philosophy. And it consists of a kind of philosophical investigation and contemplation of the you know philosophical arguments and philosophical ideas and part of the reason why he's going to see meditation as being closely connected to philosophy and and, and philosophical ideas is that for Dharmakirti if if your meditation, if your contemplation is not grounded in proper reasoning and, 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 and philosophy, then your yogic perceptions could lead you astray. Uh, you could have you know, certain hallucinations or, or just perceptions that are caused by auto-suggestion just, just, or just any mental images that are not based on, on the truth. Just something you came up with or something someone told you and you just you believe it. Um, and, and he thought that all of this was, was possible unless you, your understanding uh, was properly grounded in, in reasonable and reliable sources of knowledge and, and proper arguments. So, Dharmakirti's 
analytical form of meditation, which continued to be influential throughout the history of Buddhism, uh, also influenced other other Buddhist thinkers and Madhyamaka thinkers. And it actually remains a, an important kind of meditation or, or contemplation or whatever you want to call it in modern Tibetan Buddhism today. So in some quarters of Tibetan Buddhism, if when you meditate, it's almost like you're doing philosophy. You're contemplating like the arguments for the non-existence of the eternal self. Uh, you sort of break the stuff up into the different parts and you like you sort of rehearse philosophical arguments in your mind and then you sort of rest your mind. And then you keep doing it until you sort of try to develop a kind of uh, intuitive understanding of what the argument is saying there. Now, Dharmakirti was a philosopher, but he was also a kind of apologist. In, in the manner that he was, he was defending classic Buddhist religious theories. And this includes theories like karma and rebirth. In his uh, famous and influential defense of the doctrine of rebirth, Dharmakirti is going to begin by mounting a criticism of uh, materialism or physicalism. This was a view that was held in ancient India by a school called the Charvakas. And they held that consciousness arises from physical elements, from the body. So they were, they were a kind of physicalist, uh, just like today we have physicalists, functionalists, uh, different kinds of identity theorists and so on. This, this uh, ancient Indian school held a similar theory. Dharmakirti, like, like non-physicalists today, <laughs> Uh, it's kind of like the argument is being rehearsed now that that ha ha that happened in the past. Uh, Dharmakirti thinks that physicalism just can't explain how something which is not conscious, uh, like matter, can give rise through something which is conscious. Uh, just because something that is not conscious can go through various transformations, says Dharmakirti, doesn't mean that it could transform itself into something completely other, like something which is conscious. So he's going to argue that only conscious events, only other conscious events can causally produce uh, a conscious event. And then he's going to say, well, we have this present stream of consciousness, this constantly changing stream. And this can't have arisen from the body itself because the, the actual physical elements of the body are non-conscious. So he's going to say, that means there must have been, before the body existed, the stream of, there must have been some previous stream of conscious events, which caused our, which lead up to our present moment of consciousness right now. So this is kind of the basic outline of Dharmakirti's argument for the existence of rebirth. Um, and it's still used today by, by Tibetan philosophers. If you ask the Dalai Lama, like, how do you know rebirth is true? He's going to give you this argument. Finally, the last thing I want to say about Dharmakirti, he was the first philosopher, as far as I know, in any philosophical tradition that explicitly recognizes the problem of solipsism, the problem of other minds. And he wrote a, a text on this topic, uh, which is called The Justification of Other Mind Streams. And in this text, he's basically going to make a... Uh, argument to the best explanation of saying what you know what's the best explanation that we observe other people that look just like us they walk around they talk just like us they act just like us the best inference from that is that they're just like us and they have minds like we do and that's that's going to be the basic uh, argument he, he puts forth here so the pramanabada school especially these two thinkers dignaga and dharmakirti they were they were exceedingly popular in ancient india among buddhists and also they were widely read by non-Buddhists. And they were seen sort of as the Buddhist philosophers par excellence. So whenever Buddhist was criticized after these thinkers, whenever Buddhist was criti Buddhism was criticized by non-Buddhist thinkers, they were critiquing the uh, philosophies of Dignaga and Dharmakirti. Uh, almost every time you read any other thinker after Dignaga and Dharmakirti criticizing Buddhism, they're criticizing the views of these philosophers, at least they're, they're criticizing these the most. Um, and, and, and this was a very 
influential tradition also because it had a lot of different figures afterwards, many, many different Pramaravara figures, including various commentators like Devendra Buddhi and Sakya Buddhi, both from the 7th century. You had Dharmotara, you had Prajna Karagupta, uh, late, later thinkers Shankarananda, Jnana Sri Mitra, Ratnakirti in the 11th century, all the way up to the end of Buddhism in India, there were thinkers in this epistemological tradition writing on the works of Dignaga and Dharmakirti, commenting on their work, expanding their theories in different directions and responding to the critiques of Hindu philosophers. Um, and then in the next video on our series, we're going to see how this tradition influenced Yogacara and Madhyamaka and how they took up these theories and, and responded in different ways. And, and debated amongst themselves over like how much of these theories to adopt and so forth. And here are the sources I used, uh, the main sources I used for this video. Jan Westerhoff, Mark Sideret, they're amazing and they go over this territory in way more detail than I could in this video. Thanks again for watching my channel. Uh, and don't be afraid to think, be fearless wisdom.